Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. And oh, let's do the clappy thing. Come on. Happy Mother's Day. For all the moms, thank you so much for all that you do and share the love of Christ in a million different ways. So that's a cool thing. Uh, I forgot to tell the first service that Pastor Heather wasn't here. I don't know if they noticed. <laughs> don't tell her I said that. I'm sure they did. But uh, she, it's just a vacation uh, Sunday. She's been gone all week. And then uh, a couple things to bring to your attention, just real quick. It is time for registration for VBS already. Amazing. But that happens. Oh, thank you, Steve. That's, oh, you went past it. It's the super colorful one. That's the one. Oh, you skipped it again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Stop there. So um, that's the Vacation Bible School. We're looking for registrations already. We're looking for help already. So time to get the word out to the neighbors and the neighbor's kids and random strangers you run into. Just don't do it in a creepy way. Uh, the Lutheran campaign is underway. Camp Lutheran, that's been part of our synods ministry since the 40s, is doing, they always upgrade, they always keep up, and they're working on a capital campaign right now for uh, replacing some cabins and doing some other things. Uh, <clears throat> we, had, uh, we had people selling, uh, Phyllis was selling, uh, giving, handing out pledge cards. Phyllis! Phil and she will be in the back with all new material. So if you got some last week, you need this week's to complete the set. <laughs> right? So apparently at this point we're going collectible stuff. And they're all different. Collect all four. All right. And, uh, and then we are very delighted to be baptizing our dear friend Olive. We have been, you guys might have known that we've been praying for Olive for a while. Olive initially had been, we were planning on baptizing her on Palm Sunday. And uh, Mother's Day is perfect. Olive had had some problems. She was in um, ICU for a while, kind of in and out for a, about two weeks, you think? Somewhere around there? Three weeks? A lot of weeks. Most recently and then before that. So Olive has, has had a, a lot of stuff in her year, or 13 months or however old she would be now. A lot of stuff. So we're glad to welcome all of you into the body of Christ today. Anything else that needs brought to the attention of the congregation? All right. Um, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We've got to dig into those. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share the peace. Peace, peace. We have the, the hymn, and then we're gonna. When we come forward, we'll get you going pretty short after that. All in the Please stand and follow the cross in as we begin with our opening hymn.
Is my mic on? Is that better? No. My apologies to those of you who are or on Zoom. Ready to roll? Okay. In holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Anointed with the Holy Spirit, we join in God's mission for the life of the world. Called by the Holy Spirit and trusting in the grace of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? We do. As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with these responsibilities. You are to faithfully bring her to the services of God's house and to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. You are to nurture Olive in her faith and prayer place the Holy Scriptures in her hands, and provide for her instruction in the Christian faith. All of this, so that Olive may come to know the God who loves her, and may come to respond to Christ with a life of faithfulness to God and service to others. Do you promise to help her grow in Christian faith and life? Yes. And you, the Godparents, do you promise to nurture Olive in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit, and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church. We do. And you, the people of God, do you promise to support this family in the promises they have made and to pray for all of Josephine Cowie in her new life in Christ? We do. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the water and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water, you nourished and sustained us and all living things. Blessed, Blessed be God, be God now and forever. forever. By the water of the flood, you condemned the wicked and saved Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery, into the freedom of the promised land. Blessed be God, now and forever. In the water of the Jordan River, your son was baptized by John and anointed by the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, our <coughs> Your beloved Son has set us free from bondage to sin and death and has opened the way to the joy of freedom and everlasting life. He made water a sign of, the clean, of cleansing and of the kingdom and of rebirth. In obedience to his command, we baptize and make disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, now and forever. Pour out your Holy Spirit so that she who's baptized here may be given new life. Wash away her sin. I'll take this for just a second. Wash away her sin as she is cleansed by this water and bring her forth as an inheritor of your glorious kingdom. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. I ask you and all who are gathered here to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in we, which we are all baptized. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? I, I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I, I believe, believe in God, God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hall of Josephine, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good job. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your sons and daughters from the power of sin and for raising them up to new life in this holy sacrament. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of Josephine, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. All of Josephine, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. All of may your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. O God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon all of his father and mother. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness for her. Strengthen them in their own baptism so that they may share eternally with her the salvation you have given them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the Lord's family, into the mission we share. I receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's love to all the world. the coolest thing that can happen on Mother's Day. So every Mother's Day, no matter when it falls, this is going to be Olive's baptism day. Olive, this is your new family. There's a whole bunch of them, but there's even more. 
Because everybody in Christ is now working with you to tell Jesus to the world. And body of Christ, meet all of <laughs> your new sister. <laughs>
A reading from Acts. Paul stood in front of the Oropagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he is needed anything, since he himself gives to all the mortals of life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, through indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of you own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought to not think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and one of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. A reading from Peter, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. You do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once 
and for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through the water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will not see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You can have a seat. It is the best of times, because the mic works, and it is the worst of times. We had to read this, most of us had to read this middle school, high school, right? Tale of two cities. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. And if you you think about our times, our age, and said, why is it the best? And you could sit down and think it over a little bit and, and come up with a list, I'm sure you could, Some of the things might be a little vague, but you'd come up with a list. If you say, how are these the worst of times, there'd be no delay. You'd be writing stuff down so fast that you're thinking of it faster than your hand can move, right? This is true. It's so easy to see the worst things. And in the church, it is very hard to say these are the best of times because we're overwhelmed with the worst of times stuff, right? And I don't mean congregation to congregation. I just mean all of us across all denominations. It's tough. And we can see it's the worst of times. If you chart out our attendance, everyone across the board, if you would chart out the influence that we have in the culture, if you would chart out how many people put this as number one priority and how many people put it kind of on the list going further down well your graph would look like this and you'd have to be adding paper and you'd end up drawing a line on the floor it's rough it is a hard time to be the church and if you look back There's always been rough stuff. 
right? There's always been things that have been wrong. But in the beginning, the church was sort of a, a neglected and kind of annoying sect of Judaism. After the fall of Jerusalem, it becomes sort of an underground movement with intermittent active persecution. But starting in the year 313, Emperor Constantine, Caesar Constantine, decides that Christianity will be tolerated within the empire. Ten years later, it's no longer just tolerated. Christianity is the official religion of the entire Roman Empire. And from that time, there has been a thread that goes throughout all of history where Christianity is pretty much the root of Western civilization, starting in Northern Europe, then all Europe, then North America, all over, for a long, long time. Through the fall of Rome, the church is still there. Through the Dark Ages, the church is still shining light and kind of keeping things together. Through eras where there was nothing but these little goofy kingdoms and no organization, the church kind of held things together, provided mail, provided what little international stuff was going on. Throughout the, throughout the Renaissance, most Renaissance art that we know is church-related art. Through the age of empire, a lot of that done in the name of Christ, good or bad. Through the Industrial Revolution, through, even through the Space Age, everything was, we knew the stories, everybody knew the stories, whether they believed them or not, it was a civilization, a country, everybody knew who Jesus was, they knew basic stories, they knew at least you were supposed to say, God bless, or God something. Some of the things that the church went through in that period were kind of embarrassing, shameful, horrible things, right? There have been brutal conquests. There have been genocide happening people blame Jesus for. The Crusades, all of that stuff. There's been a lot of good stuff that has come. Um, hospitals and the entire university system in, in Europe and then later in the U.S., all of our understanding of what morality is, what mercy looks like, what justice is, is influenced by that strain of Christendom, the Christian kingdom, empire, that kind of undergirds everything for a long, long time. Christendom has seen the rise and the fall of empires, of countries, even of languages. They've come and gone. Now, in our age, in the information age or whatever it is this week, Christendom is giving out its last gasp. It's in the hospital gown with the nasal cannula, struggling for breath, pushing the nurse call button frantically. It is, in a lot of ways, the worst of times. We all look back those of you who've been in the church for a while can look back. Even if your history goes back just to before COVID, you could say, well, it was fuller. More things happened. I, I talked to, and I've mentioned this before, I know, but I am one who relates to the new pastors who come into the synod. I've been doing this for a long time. And when people get their brand new first church ever, and they have their first Christmas, uh, usually in January, I call them and I said, well, did they tell you the story? And they'll say, what story? You know, the story how on Christmas Eve, they, they had put chairs down the aisle because it was so crowded. And they'll say, how did you know that? You know my church did that? Said, they all do that. <laughs> Everyone tells that story about how things were, and now you look and there's a lot more space in the pews than there used to be. But I got to tell you this. When I discovered that our first lesson today, the Acts 
17 lesson was on the slate, I was super excited. I know that sounds geeky, but honestly, I was super excited, and here's why. I have been using this story as an example for a long time. This has not been far from my thoughts for, I don't know, a decade maybe? Constantly go back to this. Because it's a story about square one. You know the board games, right? The Milton Bradley board games or whatever, and you get the little plastic thing that kind of looks like a chess pawn, and and you go along, you roll the dice or do whatever, and you go along, and then you hit that space or get that card that says, go back to the beginning, right? Start over. Go to square number one, and that's where we are. It is easy for us to say this is the worst of times and we focus on all the things that we have lost, but here's the thing too, about being on square one, you're starting again. Square one is the beginning. It's the best of times because of all that can come in the future. Our story in the first lesson, the one that I'm so excited about, it's St. Paul in Athens and he is standing in front of the Areopagus which is a hill, and there's a bunch of temples on, like temples to everything you can imagine up there. Google search it, because even now, and all that stuff just ruins, it's super cool. It's very impressive. Now, 2,000 years later, <laughs> he's standing in front of this Areopagus, and he is on square one, and he knows it. Because now he is outside of a Jewish context. He had been telling the gospel to people who had the background. He would go into a town, he'd look for the synagogue, he'd stand in the synagogue and say, you know all those stories we know, all, those, all the psalms and all the stuff, and he could just spit things out and people knew them. He could assume that they knew what he was talking about and he would connect Jesus to all of these things and people would say, oh, I never thought of it that way. Or, Oh, that makes perfect sense, because they had something that he could stand on to get the conversation going. Now he is in Athens. He is in Greece. There's nothing in common that he has. He's got the little card that sent him back, and he has to start from just about nothing. And so he does. Paul looks for that he looks for that one thing that he can connect to, and it's a stretch. So he goes to the Areopagus, and he's looking around, and he sees all the stuff that's on the, all this collection of temples, the temple district, and he says, I have noticed how spiritual you people are. Does this sound familiar? I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. You think, what's, that was Paul's hook. And he goes around and he notices this, this altar that says, to an unknown God. Since 1820, there has been a stone altar that is probably the one that Paul's referring to. It's in the Palatine Museum, which is somewhere in the Holy Land. It's been there since 1820. The wording is not exactly the same, but it's almost certainly what they're talking about. There are temples to the unknown God that are known. And apparently people would swear, oh, by the unknown God, in case they miss one, right? They had a God for everything, but you wouldn't want to miss one. Paul starts there, but here's the thing that Paul does, and this is what I think is awesome about this story. Paul does not stand up there and say, you bunch of stupid pagans are going to fry in hell. Right Now, there's a part of the modern church that loves to say things like that. You're not doing it our way. You're not seeing things from our perspective. You're clearly going to go to hell. And they believe that the mission of the church is to say, you're going to go to hell unless, and give you the out. But mostly it's, you're going to go to hell. He doesn't do that. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't bring down the hammer on them. He finds that common ground and tells them about Jesus. You have this unknown God. It's a long 
logical leap to make this connection, but he does it and it works. Here's what you don't know about. Here's what you say you you admit that you don't know. Here's that God. Let me help you out. Let me make that connection. Let me see. And that is the situation that we're in pretty much, making it the best of times. If we take this into heart, and rather than just be despairing, but say, okay, where's our hook? Where is the way that we find to connect the gospel to what is going on around us? To just sit there and condemn or despair, it's not really faithful. We have been put in this time and in this place to to share Jesus. So how do we do it? How do we go to a spiritual and not religious world? How do we go to a world that says we don't really need this and say, here is Jesus, here is hope. How do we do this without putting people off by saying, well, you're going to fry because you're not me? How do we do this? The church of Christ is and will be forever. Looking at the past is important. I'm, as you know, a hardcore history geek, so it kind of pains me to say this, but looking at where we were is only helpful if it helps us to understand where we're going. Jesus is not history. The church of God is not a relic from the past, but both our Lord Christ and the body of Christ, which we're we're in, is about and leading toward the future. Our calling now is to face that world and look for the hook. Face that world and start with Jesus. To face that world and get back to square one. Amen.
United in hope and joy, the resurrection, let us play for the church. Please kneel as you are able. God, our faithful companion, you promised to never leave us and to send your spirit to guide us in wisdom and truth. Send your people into the world to serve us, mirrors and reflect and magnify your love. Hear us, O God. All the earth sings praises you. Grant your care to the creatures, plants, and places that are suffering, and equip us to respond to their song. Make us agents of restoration and refreshment for all your beloved creation. Hear us, O God. You call all people of the world your children. Judge the nations justly. Show mercy to all who are oppressed, and speak truth to power through your prophets. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nurturing Lord, you send your spirit to grant us peace. Make your presence known to those who feel abandoned or alone, and to all who are sick or grieving. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You hold us in your loving care. We pray for mothers and mother figures. Console all who, who long to be mothers, children estranged from their mothers, anyone grieving the death of a mother and mothers who have lost a child. Support all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O God. Almighty God, you give life and breath to all things. We give thanks for the Apostle Matthias and all your saints. Sustain us by your love until we join in the saints in your glory. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord.
God does many things through our offerings. God helps us through these offerings and takes everything that we have and everything that we are, our thoughts and our words and our actions, to help us find a connection and bring hope to a new and ever-changing world. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shall rest with blessings, as you have raised us to new life through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Indeed, holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. 
You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these, own, these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. may be seated for a moment, and for those of you who are commuting at home, am I allowed to get a heavy set of makeup? I hope you can hear me at home. Am I good? Okay. Please take your bread, the body of Christ given for you. And now you Tiny cups. Get a cup and one on the side and fill them with 
Body of Christ living for you. Body of Christ living for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah.